Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for the great truths that we have seen from your word, the wonderful realities that we have just sung of. Lord, we want to be captivated by them. We want to worship and give glory to you as you are do it. Lord, we thank you for a wonderful celebration of the birth of our Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this evening, as we have read various passages, we have seen that the Christmas story isn't about an eternally existing God taking on flesh. And yet, that is not ultimately what Christmas is about only. We've seen that God, in taking on flesh, fulfilled a multitude of promises, demonstrating his divine power, his incredible sovereignty, his unfailing faithfulness to his people. And yet that is not ultimately what Christmas is all about. We've seen, as we've looked at these various texts, God use earthly servants to carry out his sovereign plan and will and use humble means in the incarnation of his son. But Christmas is not ultimately about these things only either. We've seen how some worshiped the God-man Jesus, and yet some men rejected this Savior and sought from the very beginning to kill the promised Messiah, and yet we've seen God sovereignly preserve Jesus' life using miraculous means. And while amazing and captivating and truly astonishing, Christmas is not ultimately about these things only either. And in the last text that we just read, we saw something shocking. We saw the promise of a Savior who would come with a purpose, one who would come in humble means, one who would be despised, one who would be forsaken, would come to bear sorrow and grief. He would be punished for others' transgressions. He would be crushed for others' iniquities. He came as a lamb to the slaughter that he might take away the sins of all, every single person who would repent of their sinfulness and believe in Jesus as their Savior. Jesus, the holy, perfect Son of God, took on flesh and lived a perfect, holy life. The only life lived that has been perfectly pleasing to the Father was Jesus' life. He lived it, and he sacrificed himself in love. And and we see that Jesus was full of love, and the Father sent Jesus out of love. And while in one moment he came as a seemingly helpless babe, just a short time after that, he would be fulfilling his purpose on earth, going to the cross. Bearing others' iniquities. Bearing others' sins taking their punishment. You see, Jesus came for a purpose. The manger was not the end, it was merely the beginning. And what a glorious, wonderful, shocking, awe-inspiring reality that God would do this for people like you and me. Truly amazing it is. Christmas should be a time of rejoicing, of celebration, as what Christ coming in the flesh represents is one who not only came, but went to the cross and and died in love for his own. Truly, if there were ever something to celebrate and rejoice over, it is this wonderful news. And yet, for many of us, that's where we find ourselves, rejoicing and celebrating and excited. And undoubtedly, there are some where the reality of life's hardness is felt more deeply than ever in seasons like this. Life is hard. We know this. Sin is real. And holidays can be especially hard in some seasons for people, and you may even find yourself struggling in your heart right at this very moment. Being in this room with us may be very difficult for you. It may be reminding you of pain or hurt or loss or discouragement or betrayal 
or whatever the case may be, you may find yourself this evening struggling in your heart and you need to be encouraged. You need to be reminded of a kind and holy and righteous, sovereign, gracious, merciful, loving God who would condescend and would come and save and rescue and reconcile and redeem and adopt and draw near to you. You this evening may be in despair and what you need to be reminded of is the reality that although you may feel alone in this moment, you are not. But God is near to you and God is mighty and God loves you, Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can be assured of the love of God which nothing can separate you from. God was willing to send his very own son to save you. And it's a good reminder to to set our mind on these things, to think on these things. It would be wrong if we didn't remember and think on these things. And yet as we consider Christmas this evening and the reality that God took on flesh to rescue sinners, it isn't even ultimately what Christmas is about. Not even that. Ultimately, you see, Jesus coming to earth wasn't ultimately about you and me. It wasn't ultimately about what God could do for us. Although we are incredible, undeserving beneficiaries of God's work. Jesus came into the world to rescue sinners, but the reason Jesus came to rescue sinners is a purpose that transcends you and me. It is indeed shocking and amazing and wonderful that that Jesus would do this, but where our awe and our amazement ends should not be on what Jesus has done for us, even though it's overwhelming to consider. You see, Christmas isn't ultimately about any one of these things, although each of these things are crucial parts of what God was doing. They were and are ultimately about something else even greater. Jesus in John 17, 1, shortly before he was betrayed, knowing what was about to happen, prays to God and begins his prayer with this. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. You see, Jesus came with a purpose. He was born born with the cross in mind, but his ultimate purpose in going to the cross, ultimate purpose was not for you and me. It was for his own glory. You see, God in his divine wisdom and planned, plan ordered, ordained things as such that the rescuing of undeserving sinners is how he brings glory to himself. What an amazing God. Jesus came to earth, taking on human flesh and living a perfect life, all leading to the cross where he would rescue and redeem sinners. And yet what was on his mind from the beginning was not any one of these events individually, but what all of these events lead to, and that is the glory of God. God's glory. That was from the beginning what was on Jesus' heart and mind, the glory of God. And God himself possesses an intrinsic glory. He is weighty. He is most impressive. He is most holy, most awesome. And because he is supremely all of these things, it is best that he is seen as such. And every act he does is a reflection of how truly glorious he is. He himself is glorious regardless of our assessment. But in his glorious state, he deserves that we ascribe to him the glory that he possesses. And what a privilege to do so. And so when Jesus condescended and took on flesh, it was ultimately about the glory of his father. And when God's promises were fulfilled in Jesus' birth, it was ultimately about the glory of God. And when earthly servants carry out God's sovereign plan for his son, it was about his glory. And when Jesus lived perfectly before God on this earth, it was 
about the glory of God. And when he went to the cross showing perfect love for undeserving ones suffering in their place, it was for the glory of God. And when he resurrected, conquering death, defeating the grave, giving life to all who believe, and as he is exalted with the name above every name, it is for the glory of God. And as we go about our evening this evening, and as we fellowship with family and enjoy food and presents and songs and games, what must it also be about for us? It must be about God's glory. It must be about God's glory. As we celebrate Christmas, as we wake up tomorrow morning and remember the birth of our Savior, God's Son, what should be impressed on our hearts and our minds most deeply is the glory of God, that we would remember all of these things well, that we might give praise to God and celebrate and rejoice in his greatness, that he would be glorified in our celebration. This is how Christmas should be celebrated. It truly is. With an unwavering preoccupation with God's glory. And there's, there's only one way that you can actually do this. Truly, there's only one way that you can ascribe to God the glory that he possesses and is due. And it's this, it's if you have submitted your life to Jesus in faith. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, if you've trusted in his work alone for the forgiveness of sins, if you have repented of a life lived for your own glory and turned away from that, and in faith committed yourself to living for God's glory, submitting yourself to him. If you have looked away from anything that you can do to make yourself right or good enough with God, and if you have recognized that what Christ has done was fully sufficient, and so you trust in him in faith, submitting to him as your Lord and Savior, and if you will but do this, if this is true of you, you too can celebrate Christmas as it is meant to be celebrated, giving glory to God. Rejoicing in who he is and all that he has done. And I would urge you, I would plead with you that if that is not the case in your life, if, if God has been a, a nice idea in your mind, but not someone that you have humbled yourself before, truly dependent upon in faith. I would plead with you, do that this evening. And let this Christmas look uniquely different and wonderful than every other Christmas you've experienced before. As you celebrate it as a means of glorifying God. And for you, believer, as you celebrate Christmas, remember the purpose for which Jesus entered the world as we spoke about on Sunday, to rescue sinners, to save sinners. And remember that he did this so that he might glorify the Father. Let that be the cry of our hearts, the tone of our fellowship, the ring of our praise this Christmas. Would you pray with me again? Father, we truly are amazed at the truth of the gospel. It really is a truth that stands alone. Nothing has been done like what you have done in your son. That he would come to earth, that he would humble himself, being born in a manger, in lowliness, and yet humbling himself even, even further, going to a cross and bearing the sin, and the wrath, the punishment, the judgment for all who would believe upon him. We will never be able to fully comprehend the mystery of this wonderful reality, but we thank you, Lord, for what it has brought into our life, namely you, fellowship with you. 
Lord, we want to worship and respond in praise and thankfulness with gratitude in our hearts as we worship and rejoice in the truth of who you are. Help us to do that well. Help us to, to please you in our worship. Help us to please you in our celebration. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.